Hey comic book fans, welcome back to Comic Book Corner 2.0 and fans, you're back with me, Mike Spider Slayer, getting ready to do the countdown, episode number 119, guys. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is the video series where me, Mike Spider Slayer, counts down my favorite comics of the week, starting from obviously the worst pick, making my way to that top pick of the week. And this week, guys, we have 19 comics that I'm discussing all together, so it's a hefty week. Got a couple of digital comics, and uh, so yeah, let's get started, shall we? Uh, let me just tell you that this was a very solid week for comic books. There really wasn't too many books that I was disappointed with, and it was really hard to come up with a countdown this week it just goes really in order of what books maybe i liked personally just a little bit more but maybe their star ratings are all about the same so here we go first things first number 19 this week and it kicks off with a digital book and really this book for me guys uh wasn't really my cup of tea and it was uh, Vertigo's Clean Room uh, issue number one. This was written by Gail Simone and uh, this was just just a very weird book about this female that sees all these weird alien like not alien but weird like creatures and uh, it was it was graphic and you get to see things that I don't know it's just weird it was like things that went on in this in this girl's like past and you see her drowning in one minute and then the other minute she's in this straight jacket or bed or whatever it was i just i didn't like it it was just very weird it reminded me a little bit of the sixth sense and i honestly couldn't tell you really what the story was about because that's how much over the head it was for me and so i just i just didn't enjoy it for that so again it's not my cup of tea uh you guys could have gotten it i might be too stupid for it so um honestly i just didn't enjoy the book so i can't really give it a rating because i didn't understand it and i couldn't capture what really what gail simone was was trying to tell here uh but it, it just again wasn't my my cup of tea of a book so uh that was number 19 on my list this week so next we go on to uh number 18 this week and uh number 18 was a book that i was highly anticipating and i was very disappointed and this time around it was uh back to the future issue number one uh you know we had back to the future day last week and it and or this week on wednesday or last wednesday or whatever it was or thursday and um this book came out on that same day and i was like wow check out this cover it looks really good stories are take they're supposed to take place in like different timelines and and surrounds the trilogy and i thought oh this would be cool marty mcfly is going on these different adventures with doc or or lane or or, or biff or whoever it is and uh we kind of don't get that in this and one of the most disappointing things is we have a great looking cover on here all the characters look like their their actor counterparts even in the in the introductory page right here uh totally looks like michael j fox in in the actual from the movie and then when you get the actual story that comes around, uh, it doesn't look like Michael J. Fox at all. I mean, I was just like, wow, this is totally off. And what they have is a format of two separate smaller stories. One story, which was okay, where Marty meets Doc Brown for the first time and you're kind of like okay though that's kind of cool and then the other story was just some throwaway story that has Doc Brown getting into the Manhattan Project and you're just like okay like you know this is a new number one book you want to get people on board and it was just a throwaway story at the end I really didn't get it and from what I read in the back of this, where the letters page should be, it was told that this is not really an ongoing series. This, for now, is a four-issue miniseries, and if they get enough positive response, that they will continue the series. But what you need is you need a story arc here. You need an adventure for these guys to go on that surrounds the trilogy. That's what make it would make it appealing. Have your 
your cast of characters that we're all familiar with to make this book appealing. And uh, I was just really disappointed with the whole thing. And that's why it really was my least like favorite book that I actually understood and read this week. And uh, this is why it got number 18 on the list. I gave it a three out of five stars. It's an average read. But it should be more than that, especially if you're trying to attract new readers to the franchise. So, uh, again, three out of five for me. And that finished off at number 18 this week. All right, now we go on to number 17. And this was another book I was disappointed with. Um, it gets a three and a quarter out of five stars. But I've been really loving this series. And, unfortunately, this time around, it just didn't hit the – just didn't hit it for me, and this was uh, Justice League: The Dark Side War, issue number forty-five. Um, I was a, a fan of um, who was it? Francis Manipal's artwork in the Flash for the Justice League. It it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit here. I think you you need the more uh, characteristic, detailed art that you're looking for in these characters, and uh, you kind of don't get that. And uh, I thought. You know, Manapel's artwork fits in The Flash. It is a lighter series, and what's going on in the series, it's very dark. And I get what he was trying to do here, but it for me, it just it just didn't work. Because you're so used to Jason Fabic being on the book, the one that does the, the, the artwork throughout the series, and then you get this thrown into you, it completely changes the tone of the book. And then at the same time, you really get this – really what it is, it's a more of a filler issue of what's going on in the Dark Side War itself to preview all the other um, uh, Dark Side – books like the uh the tie-in books that goes into this that is coming out next month and you get that at the end because it says follow the gods in all their books right here so which is uh dark side war batman and the flash and green lantern and superman shazam and lex luther and i felt that that's what this was this was more of a filler story really than anything on on following these characters in in their separate books and it was just like a glorified preview book and a filler in the overall story. So for me, I was very disappointed in this. And uh, I gave it three and a quarter out of five stars. And that was number 17. Next, we go on into number 16. And number 16 was Uncanny in Humans, issue number one. A new series released by all new, all different Marvel. Does it get this feeling that really all new, all different Marvel at this point is really not that all new and all different? Um, a lot of these series that if you're reading for the first time, you're going to have to go back and find out what's going on with with these characters. Because there's a lot of elements that happened before Secret Wars. And when I read Inhumans, I didn't read the previous volume. So I thought, okay, well this is a good jumping on point. And I... I Understand what was going on with um, Inhuman, uh, what's his name, Black Bolt and Kang. Kang trying to get his son back, but you know when the incursion was about to happen, uh, Black Bolt left his son with Kang to protect him because he didn't want his son to die. And now Black Bolt wants his son back, and so. All hell is breaking loose with that. A lot of the characters I'm not really too familiar with. The artwork was okay for me. It didn't blow me out of the water. I thought it was a very bland, not as colorful maybe as it should when it comes to maybe uh, an Inhumans book. And um, and by the time you got to the end of it, the end was the, the most interesting part where I would think, okay – Maybe I want to continue reading this because you finally get Johnny Storm involved in the whole thing and you get to see that uh, he shares a kiss with Medusa and Black Bolt comes walking in and uh, after they share the kiss and he's kind of like, well, it's kind of not what you think. And then Medusa's like, oh, yeah, it is kind of what you think. So um, that part of it kept me like, OK, maybe this is kind of interesting because I want to see what happens between those guys. I really didn't care that much about the main portion of this story here so um if this you know there's a lot of books that are out right now and if this is one that you're on the fence about you know you can and, and if you're not a huge inhumans fan this might be one that you might want to leave behind i don't know we'll see how it 
turns out. So uh, I gave this one a three and a quarter out of five stars as well. All right, next we go on and we go on to number uh, 15. And number 15 was Voltron issue number two uh, uh, from the ashes. Um, this issue continues the obviously the rise of our new uh, pilots of what's going to be controlling uh, Voltron in the future. Um, the problem with this book is that it's kind of all over the place. Uh, you get to see a whole bunch of people in the uh, in training camp, I guess if that's what you want to call it, or, uh, or boot camp, and they're doing all these competitions, they're training to become, which is the next pilots of the Voltron, and uh, these, these uh, monks are the ones that are trying to decide, you know, who's going to be that next party uh, to pilot the robot, and the, it's been very peaceful throughout the galaxy for many, many years, and, you know, you get to see which Hagar in the book as she's trying to um, um, bring back, I guess, these road beasts or whatever. But throughout the issue, all you get to see really is this cast of characters that are training and are winning and playing capture the flag and, and things like that. And you really don't get a feel of who these characters are, where the character development is, and it was a little upsetting. You get to see a little bit of a, a flashback of the old Voltron for for this purpose and this issue. I didn't really feel it was all that necessary. And by the end of it, when they complete their course, their their training purpose, and they were going to determine an actual winner of the competition, we find out that all of a sudden, uh, once again, they're at war, and they picked what you think is the red team to go pilot Voltron while the rest goes to the dorm rooms, and they have to fight the row beasts once again, which look like this. And so by the time you got to the end of it, you were kind of like, okay, that's pretty cool. They get to fight some row beasts again. That's the shit I've been waiting for the whole time. I didn't care about the unnecessary flashback. It had nothing to do with the story whatsoever. We spent the entire issue playing Capture the Flag and no real character development. So there was a lot of weaknesses in this particular story. But it's cool to see Voltron back, you know, reliving my childhood. Uh, but this is not one that you have to really go out of your way for. And uh, I did give this one a 3.5 out of 5 stars because it does has decent artwork. And I want to see really where this story is going. It left you with a cool cliffhanger here. So... I have faith in Colin Bunn. All right. Next, we go on to number 14. And number 14 this week was Star Wars Shattered Empire, issue number four. I give this one a three and three quarters of, of five stars. My only problem with Shattered Empire um, is that this book doesn't seem like a cohesive story whatsoever. And I felt like if this really leads into The Force Awakens... Uh, or you would think it would have more of a story dealing or going into that that universe or to that next story. And, uh, you know, at the end of the last issue, we wound up seeing what really should have been the end of the story because Emperor Palpatine ordered this Operation Cinder to destroy Naboo and we saw them prevail. So in this issue, what happens is you wind up the main character, what's her name? I forgot her name, Shara or something like that. Oh, I forgot her name. The the main female character in here, uh, Poe Dameron's mom, uh, she winds up going back to the base and she's got about a week left before she retires from the Rebels and enjoys her family. And the next thing you wind up seeing is Luke Skywalker just strolls on in and he's like, hey, you want to go on a mission with me? Just out of all the people... He's like, come with me. You look like this person. Let's go. And so what happens is Luke and uh, and Poe Dameron's mom go on this onto this rebel base, and they have to recover like these two Jedi trees. And it, it was like these only trees in this existence. And and she poses as one of the commanders. Uh, the other Imperial was on to the situation, so they wind up fighting. They wind up doing this battle. And so what happens is that it's a very predictable outcome. You obviously know who's going to win in this in this issue. And uh, it was cool artwork. I mean, the artwork is gorgeous. Stormtroopers are beautiful. Good action in the book. Um, 
But in the end, they recover these trees. She winds up going home, and she winds up uh, together with her husband, and the end, and that's it. The only thing that I guess you really get from this is that you know that uh, this is Poe Dameron's uh, mom and dad. That That's all you get from here, and it's like a, he's, he's – going to be born soon um and that's really all you get out of this book i you know i felt that you know the first three issues had to deal with the story and then this fourth issue was just like a side story for fun you know i i don't know it was just weird I, and i i expected a little bit more out of shattered empire i liked the series but it was is something i was just i don't know there was I, I thought they would take a different route with it. So uh, after again, after reading that one, it's uh, a three and three quarter out of stars for me. All right, next we go on to uh, number thirteen, and uh, number thirteen this week was Gotham Academy issue number eleven. Um, I like this book. I think this book is pretty cool. Uh, we get to see really this female Olive, if you guys are not familiar with uh, Gotham Academy. She's in search for her mom. And we find out that in this in the series so far that her mom is this villain who looks like controls fire. And uh, she's always been trying to find her mom since the, since the beginning of this series. And she has this little female character by the name of Maps. And they like to go on detective cases. They like to solve things. And in this issue, we find out that Kyle, who is a tennis player, which is this guy right here, which is totally fitting for me. I'm a tennis player. And uh, he's going to a tennis tournament, I think, which is in Gotham. And then what happens is in the meantime, while he's playing his tennis tournament, we see that Maps and Olive come up with this, uh, this huge map to try to investigate the situation and what's going on to try to find answers about her mom. And, uh, I, you know, the the one thing, the person, the character that really makes this comic for me is Maps. I think Maps is a, is a really great character. Her tenacity is awesome. She acts like a Robin, and it's referenced here uh, as Tim Drake actually makes his appearance in the book as well as they work together. And Maps has this cool little crush on Tim Drake, which I thought it was awesome. Uh, she's totally in love with this guy. And uh, she's like, oh, I hope, I hope we see each other again, you know. And she's all, she's, she's all in love with him. And she's all googly eyed. Hopefully, I don't know if they have a another picture of it in here. Hopefully they do. Yeah, here it is, right here. So it's a fun read. It's a good book. I, I wouldn't say it's like monumental, groundbreaking, best read I've ever read. But if you like a good mystery, this is an awesome book. At the end, they wind up finding this this mystery key, and where this mystery key goes goes to Arkham Asylum. So it looks like that might be where their next adventure takes them. Um, I think this book reads best in trade. I think you can really get a true enjoyment when you read this in a again as a trade instead of individual issues. So you stay connected with the story all the way through. So. Um, I give this one again uh, three and three quarters out of five stars. Probably would have been higher on my list if it wasn't such a heavy week. It's such a solid comic book week. All right, so now we go on and we go on to uh, number 12 this week. Now from number 12 gets a four-star rating. There's some good books out here. All right, so number 12 goes to uh, Titans Hunt issue number one. I thought this was a well – I think it's a very intriguing book. I think this book makes you want to continue to read and discover who the Titans are and where they came from. Because really in this issue, you find out that our Titans here are, are trying to uh, – I guess they're trying to remember something, something that's going on, and they can't quite remember what it is. And uh, you wind up seeing – uh, Roy Harper, Speedy in the issue, uh, you wind up seeing Lilith, and you wind up seeing all these classic titans. You wind up seeing Dick Grayson in this book. Uh, you wind up seeing, uh, I think his name was was Garth, which is the Aqualad guy uh, in here. And there was this operation going on where they were selling metahumans, metahuman parts to humans, and, uh, and you wind up seeing that, that – uh, Lilith was communicating to them telepathically, and so there's a lot of things going on in here, but if you're not familiar with Teen Titans of the old, you're going to be completely lost who these characters are, and what this, what this book does, what this book makes you 
do is when you get done reading it, it makes you go on to Google and find out what's going on and who these characters really are. And uh, and I think that this is really not a good jumping on point for a lot of readers, but it is very intriguing because if you want to know more about the story and you're interested in the series, you're going to be like, I, I got to do some research here. Um, but it has good artwork. It was a solid looking book. I uh, like the colors in it as well, and uh, you get to see some cast of characters that you haven't seen in a long time, and this this is plays uh, good for old old uh, DC fans. So after reading this one, I gave this one a uh, a four out of five star book because I think it is a good series. Uh, I just need some getting used to. Hopefully they do some character development in here to get it new reader friendly, and uh, I'm going to continue it. So I gave this one a 4 out of 5, lowest of the 4 out of 5 books. All right, next we go on to number 11. Number 11 was Invincible this week. Uh, Invincible goes on to that reboot title where we think that maybe the universe was getting reboot. That wasn't the case. If you read the last issue, you wind up finding out that Mark goes back in time and, uh, well, he gets captured by some weird plant white creature and it brings him back in time. Brings him back to his high school years. And uh, the cool thing about this book is that you get to see Mark when he was really young and skinny and uh, he meets Adam Eve for the first time again. And... um, you can really feel the emotion in Mark where he feels that he's scared. He doesn't know what to do. He's trying to go to all his friends that he knew from the past for some answers. And uh, he meets up with his old teammates. And it was an interesting book. My only problem with the book is it felt a little rushed. And as far as I know, I think this is only taking place for four issues, maybe five. And so I felt like I didn't, I wanted more time with Mark finding out where he was or how to deal with the situation at hand with him being back in time, uh, stumbling his way through old friends, not making mistakes, have it a little bit comedic before it got so serious. And that's what happened with me in this particular issue. Um, It was just right away it got to Mark going, I need answers, I need to find out what's going on. Uh, He was very emotional. He's like, I wanna get back right away. And then right away he confronts his dad and he goes, dad, I don't want you to take over the galaxy. And uh, his dad is like all pissed off at him. So I think that is really my big problem with this particular issue. It's not a real problem. It's just something I would've, like to see maybe a little bit further down the road. I wanted to see him experience some fun uh, going back in time for a little bit, going, hey, man, this is kind of cool. I, I want to see what I was like back then, you know, and and maybe not being so uh, – being a little bit careless about the situation and, and just being a little bit light instead of diving right into a very serious story. Uh, so I liked it, though. I gave it a four and a half out of five stars. All right, so now we go into our top 10. We've talked about nine. We're going into the top 10. Look at that. That's kind of cool, right? My face right in there. I'm stupid. All right, anyway, uh, number 10. This was an enjoyable read for me, and this was overall a pretty good series. This was one of the Secret Wars books that that I never thought I would like, and it surprised me compared to some of the other books that I thought I would like. And this was Weird World, issue number five, the conclusion to this. As we get to see our our hero, Akron, uh, trying to look for his lost kingdom. And he spent the whole entire series trying to look for his kingdom called Pomiculus or Pomoculus or whatever name they came out with this. And uh, we wind up finding out that he's doing battle against uh, Madame LaFay, I think that was her name. And uh, she is the, the the sorcerer queen of Weird World. And Akron comes up to this decision going, you know what? If I can't find my kingdom, I'm going to take over Weird World. I'm going to make this my kingdom. I'm going to have my followers. I'm going to have followers. And he tries to take on Madame LaFay himself at first. Madame LaFay takes the advantage and he finds finds out that as he gets thrown off a weird world, he had a desperate attempt at clinging on to the rock.
rock's ledge at the end, he sees that his kingdom was beneath him the entire time. It was right beneath his feet, and he was in awe, and he couldn't believe it. So it gives him a newfound way of trying to fight. He comes back, and right when he thinks he's going to get defeated, all the people that have come across his journey, which I thought was really neat, uh, has aided him by his side. The crystal warrior, the swamp creatures, eyeball creatures, anything that you ever thought. The best part about this book was that earlier in the series that he collected this crystal, he worked with the crystal warrior and the crystal warrior said, I will aid you and help you and give you a map if you find my king. And when he found the king, it was like this, this guy in shattered pieces in the bag. And he's like, are you freaking kidding me? He's like, this is your king? He's just in shattered pieces in a bag. This is what that king looked like at the end of this series. And he's like, you have helped my warriors. You have helped me piece myself together. He's like, I'm going to help you win. And it was just – it was awesome to see Akron come together and really – work with all these uh, all these oddball creatures to try to defeat the the sorcerer the artwork is really intense it's very painted like art um it really does fit the tone of this book because it's weird and it's weird world so it totally fits uh facial expressions when there are in here are beautiful and uh you wind up seeing akron getting ready to um win the battle over Madame Lefay and then what happens is this is the first time that you get to see something that happens with uh, Battle World and you wind up seeing Battle World explode so I've never seen we haven't had any real hints of what happens in Secret Wars but Battle World explodes and then you get regular Earth reforming once again and then what happens is you get to see a plane crash into this new version of Weird World, and you find out that uh, Akron, yes, is in charge of it. So it's really, it really was a cool book. And then this book uh, continues in the um, uh, going forward in December. So I'm definitely going to check this out. I, I was surprised with this. I think Jason Aaron did a nice job. Uh, with this series and this is one of those sleeper books I felt uh, that was very underrated so if you want to try out a series uh, when it comes out in December give it a try so uh, I gave this one a four out of five stars again not for everybody same with the style of artwork it's not a perfect read but it was entertaining all right Next, we go on to number nine, and number nine was Batman and Robin Eternal, issue number three. Really good series. It's been holding up. You would think number nine, that's kind of shitty, Mike, but again, this was a book where there was lots of solid reading, and uh, it was just books that I preferred uh, more than others, and in this series, uh, the artwork's is not always Tony S. Daniel consistent artwork, but it's good artwork and the colors are nice. And uh, I think they're trying to get it as close to the original artwork as possible. Um, the book starts off with a bang as you get Cassandra Kane uh, battling um, uh, Jason Todd in this particular issue. You wind up finding out that Grayson's uh, little assistant wind up going rogue so you wind up can't really uh finding her in the uh actual issue um you also get a little bit of a flashback in here with grayson and batman which i thought was neat as he's as grayson's like worst fear was not living up to uh, batman's expectations so i thought that was really cool and uh you wind up finding out that they had to go to this um uh, charity ball and uh, and Grayson had to hurry up and rush on over there because what's going to happen is uh, you find out that the mother's little servants are going to be after uh, Bruce in this issue. I thought this issue was good. It was solid. It was a little bit slow. It started off with a lot of action, but you're starting to get the story develop here. You're starting to get a little bit of who the mother is and what her what she's trying to do with this human trafficking type of thing. Uh, again, solid book for a weekly series so far. For me, this tops uh, Batman Eternal so far. So after reading this one, same thing. I gave this one a four out of five stars. All right, next we go on to number eight. And number eight this week was The Beauty, uh, issue number three. Um, in this book, 
If you're not familiar with the beauty, it's a disease that's sexually transmitted uh, that winds up making everyone beautiful. But what happens is after you have it for so many days, boom, you wind up exploding. And that's been happening more and more throughout Tokyo and the United States. And we get to see our detectives trying to solve this particular um, this case. So this issue starts off very weird. Um, it starts off with a, a, a female in this book who is is um, who has the beauty but doesn't do very much and sexually wise. And this is a sexual part. And uh, she was a prostitute. And then you wind up getting to see uh, this guy, this mysterious guy at the end of it, uh, who has this uh, who has this knife. And uh, you're like, oh, okay, this guy's pretty weird. He's going to kill this prostitute. So um, in the issue, you wind up seeing the two detectives uh, try to escape their uh, assassin assassins or whatnot. They were going to try to kill them. Uh, we get to see that the government is trying to cover up everything. And really what you find out that in this particular issue that uh, the government wants a pill created – from a pharmaceutical company to distribute to keep life longer not to cure it but to make millions and millions on the pharmaceutical part of it and so what happens is we find out that there's this this underground agency or whatever it is or these these guys who came up with the cure originally and they wind up being kicked out and they're, they were still working independently and so now they have this cure they wind up curing our detectives here um, from the beauty and uh, they're going to try to cure everybody else they got to mass produce this cure and at the same time that guy, that creepy guy that we saw at the beginning of the issue, yeah, it looks like he's like the main antagonist in this book. He wears this weird mask and trench coat and just kills prostitutes. So at the end of the issue, you got this, uh, you get a whole bunch of people that took pictures here and it says hashtag beauty free. I didn't know you could do that, but that was pretty cool to do that. Book is good. I, I think it's a great mystery book. Now they have, uh, now they have something to go by, and they have to try to solve this case and try to administer this cure before people just start blowing up all over the place. So cool book here. So after reading this issue, um, I gave this one again another four out of five stars. All right, next we go on to number seven, and number seven is. Darth Vader issue number 11. Uh, this is just a cool book. I, I just really like Darth Vader in this issue, how he's trying to find Luke Skywalker. He's trying to find out who piloted or destroyed the Death Star, if they're connected. Uh, you wind up getting to find out that his little, um, his little sidekick, uh, and I can never remember her name. Also, these all these characters, female names, all sound the name, sound the same. But she was doing an investigation, trying to find out uh, who the pilot was and whatnot. And she gets information. She loads this dude up with credits. And what happens is Vader, Vader's um, inspector or sidekick that's been investigating all these Imperial credits that were stolen. Uh, Vader's been kind of stalling the operation. Well, the investigator winds up coming to uh, almost solving the case and find out where uh, where she is. I'm just drawing a blank on this real quick. On her, on her location. And uh, what happens is Vader is forced to almost kill uh, his little sidekick in the issue. And every time there was some kind of information that was about to be poured out by this guy, uh, he, he made it, used the force, and wound up getting shot. Um, his little sidekick is trying to escape. And then what happens is uh, Vader is at that point where he's forced to possibly kill her. And right when he's just about to kill her, you know, after all this time working with Vader, she sits there and she goes, I, I know where the boy is. So she's talking about Skywalker in the issue. And uh, he's like, oh, tell me. And she gives him location and he comes up with this trap where he – Vader tries to stall her escape and he winds up actually having some – all this debris collapse on him and whatnot and um, – 
and he stalls her escape so she winds up escaping spares her life and then what happens is we wind up finding out that the Imperials had set a trap for her just in case she did escape. So now she winds up getting captured and she's going to be wind up forcing the talk. And her and Vader have been working together this entire time and it's really Vader's plan. And what's going to happen when they find out that this was Vader's plan or will they ever find out? So really cool stuff. Uh, I really thought this is an awesome uh, issue and the girl's name is Afra. That's her name. And so Vader and Afra have been working together to try to find out the location of Skywalker. So great book. It's been a great mystery uh, for the Imperials finding out what's happening. Uh, great stuff here. So I'm going to give this one, yes, another four out of five stars. All right. So next we have our number six book of the week. And this goes to uh, the second digital book of the week. And uh, just give me one second to pull this one up. And this goes to Grim Tales of Terror, uh, volume two, issue number one. And this is otherwise known as Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, this was a, a nice book to read. Um, a lot of us were speculating over on Comic Frontline if Volume 2 was going to deal about more death of death in her character. Uh, but it looks like it continues the story, the direction that it's going with the one-shots. And here in this issue, we wind up learning that um, death is at this guy's um, – He's on death row. He's about to die that particular evening. And he tells his story about how he was this actual nerd in school and how he was being picked on uh, by the star football player. And this guy was very smart. He was scientific-like. And he was trying to uh, make this formula to make him stronger again. And so after it, many, many attempts at failing, he finds out that it was a successful attempt because his mouse winds up becoming like huge and on steroids or it's, it's like gigantic so out of desperation because he's tired of his mom that beats him he's tired of everyone that picks on him he drinks this potion and the next thing you find out is he's going to the emergency room because he's like what the hell did i just do and so what happens is he winds up becoming this this perfect looking being he becomes buff he can pump huge he becomes part of the football team um, he says that he is the cousin of the nerdy guy. And so as time goes along, though, uh, we find out that the Hyde part of him is taking over and he's staying that way more frequently. And he finds out that it's it's becoming a problem because when he becomes this Hyde like character, he winds up killing people. And so um, in the end, he actually winds up. Uh, framing the football player <laughs> he winds up killing his mom and then at the end of the uh, particular issue he frames himself uh, by killing his mother um, and he winds up changing into uh, the uh, Hyde character right before the police come and so that's why he winds up going to jail to get executed and to eliminate this hide creature from his soul forever so uh it was a cool story it was really entertaining it had me engaged the entire time and uh, i really liked it and i gave this one a four and a quarter out of five stars for a series to continue with these fantastically written one shots i think is a talent in itself because sometimes you need a lot of pages to tell a good story and the pacing of this particular book and the way they do it i think is brilliant and uh i love this series and uh they just didn't have it in my comic shop. That's why I didn't buy it this week, but I was able to read it digitally. So again, I gave this one four and a quarter out of five stars. All right. So now we start the top five. And number five, everybody, this week goes to the Amazing Spider-Man issue number two. Um, this issue was cool. You get to see uh, Peter Parker uh, – talk with his boardsmen uh you know they're concerned about the zodiac gang 
uh, we wind up seeing him go on to this mission, uh, going against the Zodiac gang underwater. And these characters are kind of cool. They all have the symbols of the Zodiac, which is Aquarius and, and uh, I don't know, that crab guy, whatever you want to call him, and things like that. And as they're going throughout this mission, you get to see Peter Parker deal with his technology, which I thought was really neat. It flashes back to certain elements like that. And uh, you get to see um, Spidey team up with the Prowler. So when Spider-Man, when Peter is is Spider-Man, the Prowler's teaming up with him. But when Peter is Peter, the Prowler is Spider-Man. So it's cool how he has like this dual identity. So what happens is he's trying to get his webware back, and uh, he finds out that uh, they encrypted the uh, the webware, and they wind up retrieving it, and they wind up getting Shield winds up getting all the uh, information they need to find their secret bases so i thought that was really cool this had really good elements it goes back to uh world's end uh where it had to do deal with silver sable's death and rhino being left behind um so if again when it comes to all new all different marvel if you haven't read the superior spider-man series you're going to be a little bit lost. You're going to be like, when did Silver Sable die? Or what happened to Rhino? And so uh, this is where I feel that All New, All Different is really not that All New, All Different. There's some new elements to it, but it's not really different. I mean, we get new volumes, but I don't think it's all that different because definitely with Spider-Man, you really got to read what happened in Superior Spider-Man to get what's going on. But anyway, at the end of this issue, the coolest thing about this book is that you find out – that the rhino is still around uh he's been in uh the coast of guatemala and you find out that his wife is still alive at least we think and there's this villain at the end that is bribing him to work with him by giving him his wife his wife back so who is that villain i don't know but so far at the end of the first issue we wind up seeing dr octopus this issue we wind up seeing the rhino at the end of um, at the end of that preview of the Amazing Spider-Man at the end of issue one, we wind up seeing Regent as well. So could we have a new Sinister Six being formed in front of our eyes? I don't know. We could have. We could very well see that. But this was a good book. It was a solid read. I enjoyed it. Uh, and I gave it a four and a quarter out of five stars. I'm really – I am enjoying this new direction. And I like how Peter Parker is grown up. And I like his new technology. And, uh, and, and – you know, hopefully we will see that that web slinging that a lot of us like to see, and not all tech. But uh, I, I really like this direction of Spider-Man. So again, four and a quarter out of five stars. All right, now we go on to number four. Very close now to that uh, number one spot. And number four was a book that had a lot of reading, and you got to take your time and read this one. But this was Tokyo Ghost, uh, issue number one. Uh, I'm sorry, Tokyo Ghost issue number two, the follow-up to issue number one. And so in this particular book, I got what we what I was hoping for. And it was a uh, kind of like an origin story or where these characters came from when it came to uh, Debbie and Led Dent. And in the beginning of this issue, you wind up finding out that uh, they completed their mission – they wanted to be – their contracts wanted to be terminated from being constables. And so what happens is we go into this uh, – to this um, – the guy that's in charge of the town or the city or whatever his name is. His name is Mr. Flack. And uh, he's this, this guy who just lets his dong hang out. I'm just like, who is this guy? You know. And he's in control of everything and he's in control of the constables. And uh, basically what happens is he tells these two that they have to go to Tokyo. They got to take down the warlord. Uh, so they have to let up this, this, this shield or whatever it is so they can get their resources back to Los Angeles, save Los Angeles. And they said – when they complete that mission, then he'll set them free. And they kind of really don't have a choice in the whole matter. So because this is what they want. They want themselves to be free, being disconnected. And Debbie is is the character that's not connected to technology. Dent, who is this character, is who's completely connected all the time. And uh, it was a really interesting story because you get to see on their journey to Tokyo, you get to see the origin story of these characters. And they've known each other since they were children. 
and they were first time loves, which is cool. And uh, we get to learn about how Debbie's mom uh, was, what type of character she was, how she was always connected to the internet and to social media and all this other stuff. And her mom just blew her off. And her dad was this detective. He wasn't connected whatsoever. And uh, he used Debbie. He trained Debbie. He, he, he was with her the entire time. And uh, you get to meet how him and uh, – and uh, Led Dent or whatever his name, Teddy is his original name, how they actually met. And all these elements were really cool. You get to see him when he was a kid eating like this sugar bucket, which is hilarious. Uh, but you get to see their whole origin story. And I thought it was really well done. And what you get out of it is that really what has happened, and Debbie said this the whole time, that she would never become – what her father was and it's exactly what she became she became her father who is a detective who she is a constable who is taking care of a freaking tech junkie and she can't help it but she loves him she truly loves him and i thought it was a well-told story and at the end you wind up seeing him in tokyo they found this mysterious guy when they arrive and they wind up chasing him and you find out what Tokyo looks like in the future, which is very weird. And um, you wind up finding Debbie and Teddy. They're working together. And uh, they wind up coming across this character here. Who that character is, I don't know. Is it the Warlord? Who knows? But really interesting book. This took a lot of time to read, but it was a great origin story of these characters, where they came from. And I really appreciate a series when it does that. And it really makes me feel connected to these characters now. So uh, I'm totally invested in Tokyo Ghost. Really well done, well written issue here by Rick Remender. So uh, I give this one a four and a half out of five stars. All right, so now we go on to the top three, number three, comic book of the week, and that goes to Invincible Iron Man issue number two. I thought at first this was going to be my top book, but this was one of the first books I read, so uh, it didn't fall too far down on the list, uh, but this book was really awesome because we really get to see uh, Victor Von Doom of how powerful he still is. He's just not ugly looking. He, he looks good. I mean, he looks good. He's handsome. And he's got all his powers intact. And um, and you also get to see what the Iron Man armor actually does in the issue. Uh, it, it actually, you can see it transform or morph into whatever it wants it to be. And in this issue, it changes into the Hulkbuster armor to try to stop Doctor Doom. But as you see in the issue, Dr. Doom really doesn't want to fight him. He kind of wants to turn over a new leaf and wants to work with uh, Tony Stark in this issue. Really, Madame Mask is the one that is the bad guy here. And we wind up finding out that she, she took this, um, this staff or this magic wand. Um, and, um, and what happens is, is she... I'm trying to remember. She wants to take this staff for this magic wand, the wand of Watum. That's what it is. That's what it's called right there. And so uh, he leaves it in the possession of Tony Stark to protect. And Tony doesn't believe him, but eventually he's got no choice then to believe him because he wisps him away and transports him into the <laughs> into the freaking zoo, which I thought was hilarious. And then at the uh, towards the end of this issue, uh, we wind up seeing Madame Mask making her appearance. We get to see how ruthless she really is in the book, and we wind up finding out that um, that she's very protected. She doesn't want her face exposed whatsoever. We can see uh, the horror on her face just through the eyeball, eyeball alone uh, when she finds out that there's no bullets in her cash. And I think. Dave Marquez does a wonderful job with the artwork here, and uh, when she opens the door, she sees Tony Stark um, sitting on the bed saying, hey, Whitney, what's up? And uh, the next thing we wind up finding out, she's like, I want my mask. So she puts on the mask, and uh, she starts attacking him, and uh, we find out that Madame Mask is this pretty strong character at the end. And uh, it looks like she has sorcery-like powers. And I don't think that's something that we've seen from Madame Mask before. And it was pretty shocking. And it was cool to see uh, Tony in camouflage stealth armor because he's sitting there all chillaxing, you know, by himself. And you just see himself. But if you touched him, 
you felt the armor around him. So I thought that was really cool. Well written book. I love the the dialogue between the characters. The artwork is beautiful. This is a top tier Marvel book right now. I feel that you can't stop this book. It's on fire. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see where this story continues and uh, and if Michael Bendis can uh, totally keep up the pace with this series. So after reading this one, I gave this one a four and a half out of five stars. All right. Number two. Number two goes to Wonder Woman issue number 45. Uh, this book is really good. You know, Donna Troy really had a heart in this. And uh, it felt like you felt when you were reading it, it felt like she was really turning the, uh, you know, turning for the good and listening to Wonder Woman. And, um, and what happens is in the beginning of this uh, issue, you wind up finding – uh, Aegeus, if that's how you say his name, trying to defeat Wonder Woman. And so he could become the god. And he was kicking the shit out of her at first. Artwork is absolutely gorgeous by uh, David Finch. Remember, guys, this book is written by Meredith Finch. And I think, I think she's come a long way with this series. And uh, really what happens is Aegeus winds up failing. Uh, check out more of this artwork, the blood coming from Wonder Woman's eyes, the detail that goes into it. Absolutely phenomenal. Then what happens is Strife interferes with the whole thing, and she's like, you leave now or I'm going to eat you. And I thought that was hilarious. And he's like, oh, please don't eat me. He's like begging. So he winds up escaping, uh, which is really good in the issue. And then you wind up getting to see Donna Troy here. She's come. She's become friends uh, with this female. Uh, she's shown her around town. And um, she winds up having to, uh, to uh, leave her, and she winds up going back home. As the issue progresses, you wind up seeing that um, Aegis is given a one more chance type of opportunity to defeat Wonder Woman. And uh, as Donna Troy goes to meet up with her friend once again, because I guess she leaves her backpack behind, um, she winds up coming across, I guess, her pimp daddy or whoever it was. Same person that was beating her up in the last issue, her, her boyfriend or whatever it was. And uh, what happens is Donna Troy threatens the guy and his name is Link. And she's like, oh, you got to leave him alone. And she's like, oh, yeah, or what are you going to do? And so what happens is he winds up throwing Violet Violet on the ground really hard and she he winds up killing her. And so what happens is um, she – it's crazy because he winds up going to shoot her and you can see the bullets don't have effect because she's made out of like clay. And so it, 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 he goes and he, she freaking punches the guy, like knocks him out on the floor. The book has – full of action in here and then wonder woman makes her appearance and she's like you don't want to do this this is not the right thing to do this is not going to bring her back donna troy's like but i tried to be like you and this is what happened if it wasn't because of you none of this would have happened the fight totally escalates and spoiler boom she winds up getting freaking shot in the back by an arrow by that atheist guy and uh, he thought that Wonder Woman was in danger, and she winds up dying. And I was like, holy shit, Donna Troy's dead? I'm like, what the hell? She just got introduced in the series, and now she's completely dead. And and she was pissed off. And he's like, well, I thought she needed help. And he's like, she, Wonder Woman was like, two seconds ago, you just were going to fucking kill me, and now you want to help me? So... It looks like he was trying to get on Wonder Woman's good side so he can avoid getting killed uh, by – I think her name is Arneen. I think that's how you say her name, the goddess of peace. So uh, really interesting stuff here. Next issue, it says God's reborn. Uh, I totally didn't expect Donna Troy to get killed. Uh, maybe she'll get reborn. I'm not sure based off of what that title was uh, you know, said at the end of the issue. But, man, it was a good issue, and I was like, God, I can't believe she's dead. That's a shocker. Great read, though, guys. I uh, suggest you read Wonder Woman. Just one of the best issues I've read in a while. And um, can't help Meredith Fitch and David Finch hitting it out of the park with this one. All right. Number one pick of the week. Five stars out of, out of it. Five stars. Um, and I thought this was a well-written book. The only thing that I can say that people might be upset about is stature. That's right. That is Cassie Lang, and this number one book goes to the Astonishing Ant-Man issue number one. Now, unlike all the other all-new, all-different Marvel title, um, this book really sets you in 
on what was going on in the last volume. It catches you up. And that's why this book really does get number one, because it's a complete story. Now, as an Ant-Man fan, you may not be a fan of what happens to Stature or Cassie Lang, but you definitely get your feel of kind of what happened in the last volume and what has happened to Scott Lang in the past eight months. He remembers certain things. Everything else is a flashback. But what the book really does well in here is it introduces or reintroduces to the supporting cast, which a lot of other books have not done. And I thought it was really well done. And uh, again, you get to see introduction to Cassie. You get to see the reintroduction to Grizzly. You get a reintroduction that he is uh, in charge of a security company. Um, Nick Spencer likes to write. Uh, we all know that. Based off of Captain America, Sam Wilson issue one. It was a very hefty read. This is the same way. But I felt that the pacing was well done. There was light dialogue in here. There was funny where it needed to be. There was a little bit of action where it needed to be. And the whole thing of this all is we wind up coming across Darren Cross, the main bad guy for Scott Lang. And he tries to get this henchman, this this guy, uh, this broker. His name is uh, Mr. Broker. to tries to get Darren Cross to buy this app. That's called the hench. And if you have a good guy that's on your list and you want to hire a henchman to kill him, well, it'll calculate who the best henchman is and it'll go out and kill him. And I thought that was freaking awesome that they came out with that. So the best person at the time was Whirlwind. And so Whirlwind was sent out to destroy um, uh, Scott Lang. And uh, in the meantime, Scott was trying to expand his security company by going in Miami and, and securing museums and things like that. And at the same time, uh, it was just a little bit it was just a little bit rough throwing his pitch. And they were like, oh, there's always going to be danger and blah, blah, blah. And just as he's throwing his pitch, um, that's what happens. You wind up seeing Whirlwind uh, trying to do battle against Scott. And it was awesome. It was a whirlwind of a ride it was a great book a lot of humor in here and at the end of the issue you wind up finding out that within those eight months it just occurred to him that he landed back in jail and i was like whoa how did that happen so hopefully we'll find that out but um this book was very well done this was an awesome issue i had so much fun reading it it's a great jumping on point for readers that didn't read the last volume here and this is what all new all different all marvel titles should be about and uh, I can't wait to read issue number two. So, guys, there you have it. There is the countdown for the week. Hopefully you enjoyed all the 19 books that I had to talk about. Now it's your turn to put in the comments below what your favorite book of the week was, what your worst book of the week was. And, guys, as always, thank you for watching A Comic Book Corner 2.0. And until the next comic book review, this is Mike Spider Slayer signing off. And thanks for watching, everyone. Take care. Bye.